Welcome everyone to the Internet of Water Peer-to-Peer -peer Network webinar series. Today we have a presentation about PyGeo API, a Python server implementation of the Open Geospatial Consortium's API standards. So my name is Louis Stevens. I'm a policy associate at the Nicholas Institute at Duke, and I will be your host for our Internet of Water webinar today. Uh, today, the Internet of Water's associate director, Kyle Onda, will present a relatively new way to publish data online that conforms to the Open Geospatial Consortium suite of API standards. So PyGeo API has a low barrier for use with nearly off the shelf capability, but it's also flexible enough to offer custom services for Python developers. So Kyle's gonna walk us through how to set up an API endpoint. And then he's gonna discuss several ideas for how to use this open source framework for water data applications. And I'll hand it over to Kyle in just a minute. Uh, I just need to go over a couple of housekeeping details first. So we are recording the webinar today and the recording and the presentation slides will be available soon as links on our website. Uh, so if you have to leave early for any reason, uh, or if you want to share the presentation with your friends and colleagues, then please do. It will be available for you later to do so. And at the end of the presentation, we'll have 15, 20 minutes or so for Kyle to answer any of your questions. Um, so please submit these at any time during the presentation in the Q&A box, and I'll read them out and moderate the discussion at the end of the presentation. If you have any administrative issues, uh, so if the audio cuts out or if the video isn't working, um, put these in the chat box and we'll try to get those fixed as soon as possible. Okay, and with that, um, I will turn it over to Kyle for his presentation on PyGeo API. All right, thanks for coming, everyone. Um, so yeah, I'm going to take us on a little tour of this cool new tool, PyGeo API, which we at the Internet of Water already make substantial use of, um, and it's an important implementation of these standards. So let's dive in. Um, I'm going to talk first briefly about why API standards, like why should be, why should you care about them? Um, and then I'll introduce the OGC API family of standards. Um, talk a little bit about what Paiju API is, and then have a brief walkthrough of how to use Paiju API really how to use OGC APIs uh, from the client side. Um, and then an overview of how to deploy it, how to configure it. Um, although at the end, I'll provide links to the actual detailed documentation. This isn't really going to be a tutorial walkthrough workshop. <clears throat> OK, so for those who might not be on board already, um, you know, APIs are, are great things. They allow us to automate data exchange. Um, they set the rules for how machines talk to each other. Um, but you still have to to actually, you know, do that data exchange. You still have to program, write a program that, that does that, right? Um, and so there are lots and lots of different APIs out there. And integrating different data from different organizations uh, requires more and more complex programs, the, the more diversity there is. Uh, so a metaphor I like is, is you know, charging cables for cell phones. Um, back before USB got, you know, kind of mandated by the EU, um, you had to have, you, you often couldn't interoperate chargers with charging cables with phones, and you needed to have adapters maybe. Um, and now, you know, there's some consolidation around different connectors, right? Uh, which means the same connector can be used for many specific uses for many specific devices. Um, and the metaphor, you know, also is, is about what the limits of API standards are, right? The data flowing through the connector can be different um, and can still require different programs to ultimately deal with it. But at least, you know, you can connect the devices and, and transfer data. <clears throat> so um, the OGC API standards are developed and published by the Open Geospatial Consortium. Um, they're standards specific to geospatial data. 
They are developed by international community processes, and they're all published with open licenses. So anyone can implement them for free. Um, they standardize how machines ask for and receive geospatial data. They don't standardize that that data specifically itself is standardized, that it's values and units and variable names. And whatever. That's not what this is about or what this presentation is about. That's the domain of data standards, which we at the Internet of Water also care a lot about. Um, but this is sort of a higher level than that. And is just at a very high level, allowing data to flow between machines. <clears throat> so the OGC API standards try to align with W3C spatial data on the web best practices. Um, in general, this means that um, they're associated with HTML landing pages, so search engines can crawl and index them. Um, they follow RESTful principles and serve data by default in JSON. Um, so the upshot is it's they're designed to be very easy for developers to use to build applications with. Um, they're designed to be much simpler than the older generation of OGC standards, which you might be familiar with, like the web feature service, um, which were all based on sort of these XML encodings. Um, so here's sort of the family of standards uh, for most of them. Um, the basic ideas are specified in this OGC API common standard which introduces this concept of collections of items. And so that will be common across many different types of data. Um, it also specifies a conformance endpoint where you where people can specify which uh, data standards might be relevant. Um, and then the open API uh, spec standard for interactive, you know, open API documentation. Um, so on top of common are, are built these other standards. Uh, the main one that I'm going to talk about are features and processes, but features is basically replacing the web feature service standard. Um, it's to serve vector, geospatial vector features uh, and to do spatial and attribute query on them. Um, Related to features is the environmental data retrieval, um, which is a, which was more new, um, and it's designed for observed and modeled environmental data. So it lets you do time, space, and parameter search for raster type data, data cubes, or, or sensor networks. Um, so the type of data backend would be like a net CDF file or other custom or proprietary sensor data APIs. Um, on the other side of that, on this, th there's also API standards under development for coverages, so raster data, um, as well as sort of map images and then tiles, uh, which you might use for like mobile or web apps where you just need to get the imagery out there but not do a ton of data manipulation. And then finally, processes is a standard for web geoprocessing jobs. So stuff like given a point and some other queries, give me some calculated value based on any number of other data sets that might be underlying it. Um, so again, talking about features and processes mostly, um, although PyGeo API, which PyGeo API has implemented fully, um, and it's also partially implementing or on the way to implementing the rest of these as well. Um, so what is PyGeo API? It's one of many softwares that are designed to serve data according to these standards. Remember, they're open standards, so there's many implementations. Uh, it's free and open source. It's written in Python. as a very active community of core developers, one of whom uh, works for us at the Internet of Water Team for the Center of Geospatial Solutions. Um, and so that's great, and we like it a lot. Um, it's already being used uh, in many prominent projects. Um, it's serving as a weather data API for the Meteorological Services of Canada. There's a link there for those interested. Um, sorry. Um, 
It's uh, the geoplatform.gov um, is using it to get to get to offer access to any number of federally held national scale vector data sets. Um, and it's used by our own GeoConnects project, which you may have heard of before, um, to serve out our, our reference features. Um, in terms of processes, there's some fun examples. Um, the USGS has a process, has a PyGeo API process published that's used as part of the NLDI that lets you put down a specific point and it will split the catchment and and do some other processing to return, um, you know, value added attributes for that partial catchment. Um, we have kind of a fun one uh, that lets you give a latitude and longitude and it will give you the, the closest downstream sort of raindrop path uh, from wherever point you gave it. So here I, I get the Nile after clicking somewhere in Sudan. Um, all right, so how to use OGC API features. It's pretty simple. You start at a root URL for the API. You can try this one. You add slash collections, and it will give you a list of all the collections that are in the service. Uh, you can pick a collection and add it. So I add one for HEO2 for the HUC2 units. And then you can add items onto that collection. And it will give you um, all the items, in this case, all the hook twos. Um, you can use pagination uh, with start index and limit. So if you add a question mark, start index equals three and limit equals five, it will start at the third entry and give you the five after that. Um, you can do spatial queries like giving it a bounding box. So I've given it a bounding box around here in Southern Virginia. And so it's given me the two Huck units that intersect that bounding box. You can do attribute queries. So I've asked for the name equals uh, this one, the Ohio region. So it will return only the Huck unit five for that basin. Um, and then all of that was the HTML version, and that's good for the spatial data on the web best practices. You can also get it in JSON. Um, it does content negotiation by default, so you can write programs that accept the JSON encoding preferentially, or you can just specify, give me the GeoJSON format, and then you get all of those same queries, any of the queries uh, in JSON instead. <laughs> Um, you can also get a JSON LD response, which is a capability that we've uh, poured a lot of effort into adding to PyGeo API as part of the GeoConnects linked data system. Um, but it's also useful for any sort of search engine optimization that, that you might want to put on your geospatial data. Um, if you add open API to the root URL, you get the open API, doc, the Swagger, formerly known as Swagger documentation, uh, which lets you sort of test out the API and look at all the parameters that you can modify. Um, and it's uh, it has support for more uh, non-power user interfaces as well. Uh, you can add it directly to, to ArcGIS. Um, in ArcGIS Online, you can add a layer to a map. There's OGC API features down there now. Uh, you put in the root URL. It will populate a drop-down menu for which collection you'd like to do. You can do any parameters for any of those queries, um, and, there, and then it will pop up. And you can do the same thing in QGIS. Um, if you go over here on the left in the newer versions of QGIS, you can right click on WFS. As for the new connections, similarly, uh, fill out the root URL, um, and then it will populate the collections list and you can click and drag any of them over uh, to build your map. There's more detailed descriptions for all of them at ogcapi.ogc.org. But I just wanted to give you a flavor of how kind of nice and easy and developer friendly it is to use on the client side.
Okay, so how to deploy it, how to deploy this server. Um, so the main branch of PyGeo API works like this. There's, it's, there's a Python server environment with Python code in it. Um, you can, there's Flask, there's Starlet. Um, I think there's even Django now possibly. Um, but basically in there, there's some Python code. There's some Jinja HTML templates, which you can modify to customize the look and feel of those HTML pages and a YAML configuration file. Uh, from there, you in the configuration file, you kind of configure um, connections to either local data sources like a geo package or GeoJSON file uh, or remote sources like databases um, or if you want to proxy another API, you can do that. And then when HTTP requests come in, it will translate from these data sources on the fly to the formats requested, whether that's GeoJSON HTML or JSON LD. Um, we operate an, our own Internet of Water fork of PyGeo API um, to periodically update the capabilities that, that we want um, or that the organizations we work with might want. Um, and these periodically do get folded into the main branch of PyDo API, but, but we maintain this fork to keep up to date with the, the let people have access to our, our latest and greatest features. Um, so for example, we're adding support to directly proxy Esri feature services, uh, the CCAN data API, for those of you using that as your open data portal, or similarly the Socrata Soda API. Um, and we've also introduced capabilities for custom JSON LD templates for people who really want to dig into the linked data or search engine optimization and really customize that. Um, we have a demonstration sort of tutorial set of configurations that you can look at here at the GitHub for CGS Earth, PyGeo API GeoConnects examples, because uh, our real motivating project for for this is GeoConnects. Um, to get started with local development, you can do it on any Mac or Linux terminal um, or Windows PowerShell. You would need to install Docker and Docker Compose, which I won't get into here. Um, but anyone who wants to can reach out to me directly. I'm happy to help with that. Then you would sort of organize your data in this repository, which you're free to clone you'll see the directory structure has data with three data files, um, a folder with JSON LD templates, um, and then a Docker file and a Docker compose file, and this configuration file. Okay. Um, so in in this repository, the, the data that we're configuring uh, in this Piaggio API are three different versions, basically three different formats of the exact same data set, uh, which is about stream gauges in California uh, from the water boards, I think. And we have a CSV version, a geo package with your JSON. We also have, we also configured the linkage to their CCAN API as well as their Esri feature service, which is all the same data. Um, so it's a good thing to check that your configurations are right uh, and is reporting back the same data. All right, so you would need to edit the configuration file. Right now, you just do this in any text editor. Um, it starts with a block that's just basic server settings, um, like your root URL. Um, and that's pretty much it. Uh, whether you want to enable cores, um, whether you want to do gzip, gzip over the, compress the responses over the wire, stuff like that. Uh, there's a big block of general collection level metadata for the entire server. So you give a title and you know author and who to contact about the data on that server. And finally, you configure resources. So these are the either collections or processes. I'm focusing on the collections here. So here I'm 
I'm configuring a collection called the demo CSV. So this is for the CSV file. So it has basic sort of title and description and keyword metadata. Uh, the location of a JSON LD template, which I'll get into in a bit. Um, attribute source data. So here I'm linking to the original place where I got the data. Um, spatial and temporal extent. And then finally, we're configuring how the Python code is translating to GeoJSON essentially. So here I'm specifying the data source. So in the data folder in data.csv, I'm specifying the ID field. So the column in that table that I want to serve as the item identifier, and then X and Y for longitude and latitude, because it's a point data set in this case. The stuff for a geo package is similar, except uh, you specify the, the table in that database that you're pulling from, and then you don't need to specify anything about the geometry. Um, configuring an Esri feature service backend, you give it the, the feature server and ID for the feature server layer and the ID field. That's all you need to do. Uh, for the CCAN data API, you would do the data store search resource ID. Um, so this CCAN data API call, and then it works similarly in this case. This only works for point type data, so latitude, longitude data. Um, you can also make JSON LD templates. If you're not familiar with JSON LD, it's a form of JSON that allows you to specify mappings between the, the kind of fields in your JSON and standard, um, the identifiers for standard, um, standard language around what you want to represent. So for example, what this would say is the column name is associated with schema.org slash name. Um, and so it's a good way to kind of standardize exactly what all of your columns mean um, in an un unambiguous way that machines can read. And this is basically what Google does to, to aggregate information about like uh, menu items at restaurants. And that's why you can Google that stuff. And so this is what you'd be able to do for your own geospatial data. Um, and so, yeah, you would provide a context and mappings between the values in your data frame or your, your sort of data table or geospatial data set and the, the JSON all these standard names for those values. Um, it's fairly easy to deploy locally using Docker or Docker Compose here. Here's a Docker Compose file. Um, the image we're using is the Internet of Water slash PyTube API Docker image, which is on Docker Hub. Um, you specify the port that the server will be accessible from, um, and then use the volumes to map sort of links between the data folder and the data that will be on the server, as well as your configuration file and any templates. Um, so you can get started really simply if you have uh, PowerShell or Mac or Linux, if you just clone the repository, go into the folder, type Docker Compose up, uh, you can then go point to your browser, local 5000, and it will be running. And you can click through it. And these are the collections you would see and the items you would see in the Esri collection. Um, this is the landing page generated for an individual item. Um, and the JSON LD that's been generated from that template. So you see it's piped with the name and description. Yeah. Um, as far as deployment on the internet, um, it's designed to be stateless and aligns with 12 factor concepts. Um, so it's pretty easy to deploy, you know, in the cloud in a containerized approach. Um, you either use just Docker on a Linux VM. Um, it works really well on serverless container options like a GCP Cloud Runner, AWS Sparkgate, or if you're really into managing Kubernetes, you could do that too. Um, 
some other work that's coming down the pipe at the OGC and the Internet of Water is, you know, that's all good for geospatial data. Um, but what about like time series, uh, you know, data where the location is more of a tag, but not the main feature, right? Um, so I'd say consider using the related sensor things API standard and use it as a provider for features or environmental data retrieval. Um, we're starting a project, an international project in September at the OGC called the Water Quality Interoperability Experiment. That's going to be about setting water quality uh, data standards and will include how to use OGC API features or environmental data retrieval uh, to serve that data. And PyGeo API will be uh, used to, to demonstrate the approaches we come up with. Um, if you want another data provider, like another pre-existing web service, um, you can write your own providers. It's pretty simple to. This is the link for the official PyGeo API documentation to do that. Um, also coming down the pipe is we're working on an administrative uh, GUI graphical user interface to make setup easier so you don't just have to manually uh, change those configuration files in a text editor. Um, that works on this branch of PyGeo API. And it sort of looks like this, where you would start it up and then you could configure, like, I want to add this resource. You could upload a file or specify a URL for, um, you know, for the Esri service or whatever. And it kind of guides you through like a wizard. And I'll stop here. These are just a ton of relevant links. The PyGeo API official website, it's Twitter, it's official documentation. This website is where we're starting to develop documentation for how to use PyGeo API to participate in GeoConnects. Um, this is the demo um, PyGeo API, so a place where you can go just click through, um, use it as a client. Um, these are the GitHub repositories for both the main branch of PyGeo API and the Internet of Water version. The Docker images uh, that you can pull for both of them and ways to communicate with the PyGeo API core developers are here. Um, yeah, so I'll stop there and see if there's any questions. All right, great, thanks Kyle. Um, so I don't see any questions coming in yet, but anybody in the audience, feel free to put your questions in. And maybe while those are rolling in, Kyle, can you talk a little bit more about GeoConnects and sort of the link between PyGeo API and GeoConnects? Yeah, so the idea with GeoConnects is we'd like, um, we'd like water data publishers to, to publish their data on the internet um, according to spatial data on the web best practices, which basically means every monitoring location or thing you have data about should have its own landing page and should have JSON-LD embedded in that landing page. And that's fine and dandy to tell people, uh, but we wanted to provide a relatively easy way to, to do that, um, or at least demonstrate it for people who don't want to use that tool exactly. Um, and so, this is why you're investing in PyGeo API, essentially, uh, to provide to provide that demonstration feature and that actual operational feature if people want. Okay, great. And what about the OGC water quality interoperability experiment? Um, so it's going to employ PyGeo API, is that right? Uh, yeah, so the interoperability experiment is really about um, the interaction between some OGC data standards that have previously been developed around water data um, and then the API standards and how to use them together to create pretty seamless integration of water quality data um, across different organizations. So I'm co-chairing it along with uh, Sylvain Grayet, who's from the French Geological Survey equivalent. Um, and we have participants from core developers of some OGC APIs, um, as well as various water quality kind of agencies, including EPA, USGS, um, several European agencies. 
So if anyone's interested in participating in that, um, whether on the software side or on the water quality content side to inform what data standards should be about, um, you should contact me as well. Yeah, what sort of ideas for data standards have been have been floated in that project so far? Well, the the kickoff for that project is September 13th. So, but some basic ideas of, of things we're going to tackle are, you know, should there be a, a data standard uh, for that can sort of unify the type of data that you would get from a from a continuous sensor and the kind you would get from a grab sample that you take to a lab and has all kinds of detailed metadata about it. And if so, how, how to do that effectively. Um, um, but there's also more technical questions on sort of which, which exact API standard should we should we use? Um, and PyGeo API will probably feature in that to sort of demonstrate and to be able to quickly iterate because um, it's open source and written in Python, so it's pretty easy to um, to iterate changes on changes to the API standards that might be necessary to enable water quality use cases. Okay, so we had a question come in. We have an audience member who's interested to know more about running this server in a serverless environment, such as Lambda or Cloud Functions. Can you elaborate a little bit about this feature? And do you have any examples? Um, yeah, so I don't know if I want to pull it up right here. So we, we run this on Google Cloud Run. Um, so that's still containerized, not like Lambda or cloud functions. Um, there's definitely a way to run it on Lambda, although you probably want to run that on remote data sources if, if you want to serve out large data sets, because I don't think Lambda does that well with packaging, you know, large data files with the with the Python code. Um, there, there is an example in the PyGeo API core repository uh, so geopython slash pyju api um, for for deploying it on lambda um, but I, I don't just have it on i can't copy paste it into the <laughs> app just right now <laughs> all right um so i don't see any other questions coming in uh do you have any oh here we go we got another one all right um so we have another audience member who says, for every new service I publish, do I edit the PyGeo API config YML file? Yeah, basically, there, there's one block of, there's one block, you know, of 10 to 20 lines in that configuration file that you would, that you would add for every data source. Um, and that's, and that can get tricky and you can get errors when you're doing that in a text editor, which is why we're investing in that GUI. Right. So that'll streamline that process and make yeah. it easier. All right, nice. But otherwise, have a good rest of the day. Um, and thank you, Kyle, for that great presentation. Cheers.